I'm Tom Basso. Welcome to the Dice Tower board game breakfast. Folks, there is a lot of stuff going on, so let's get right into it. This week is the UK Games Expo. UKGE, me, Sam, and Z will be there. So we hope to see you. Come by our booth. Say hi to us. If you want some promos, we'll have some of those for donations to the Dice Tower. We will have game show there. We're doing a top five there with no pun included. We are uh, doing a wits and wagers show. Uh, Q&A. So come on by. Come see us. Don't you dare walk by and not say hi to us. We would love to say hello to you at that convention. So if you want to know more about that, if you go to our website, you can click on a link there that takes you to our schedule and what's going on there. And Origins is only two weeks after that. And we have a schedule for that up too. So if you're planning to come to Origins. And also, um, yesterday, Sunday, the Gen Con event registration started up. So we have two main things going on there. That if you want to come see us, we have a booth, of course. But the events, you definitely want to come to Dice Tower Live, our big giant live show with over a thousand people. Um, and also, me and uh, Derek and Jeremy Salinas from Man vs. Meeple are going to be doing a panel on video editing and working with video. So if you want to see that, go sign up for those things. Uh, there's probably not going to be a, well, I shouldn't say probably, there's not going to be a Q&A today, folks. I'm really sorry, but we are prepping. We are leaving today to head over to England. Um, and, uh, well, that's pretty much all that. And, oh, yes, this is also important. Probably next week, our show will be a day late. It's going to be out on Tuesday next week. I apologize, but we'll see it then. Anyway, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching. Wait, we're not done yet. Let's get to the news. Right, as I said last week, the Spiel des Jahres nominees were announced. This is the largest board game award in the world in Germany. It's been going on for almost as long as I have been alive for, well, I think, 39 years now. So what was nominated? Well, in the regular category, this is the family game category, the best game of the year, the biggest one of all. There were three games nominated. King Domino, which in America you get from Blue Orange Games. Magic Maze from Fun Forge. I believe Passport's bringing this one over. I think it's a really great game. I actually considered uh, getting this one uh, for the uh, Dice, Dice Hour Essentials, but it's, it's too late. And El Dorado, this is a Reiner Knizia game, so we'll see more about that one. Uh, we haven't played all three of them yet. When we do, we'll tell you guys which one we think should and will win. Uh, for kids games, we have Captain Silver from Queen, Ice Cool. Uh, everyone's, we've done a lot of reviews on this channel of Ice Cool. And The Mysterious Forest from Yellow. Uh, then for the Kenner Spiel, these are more complex awards, uh, or more complex game, not the award is complex, the Exit Series, uh, Raiders of the North Sea, and Terraforming Mars. Um, so that's exciting. We'll have to wait and see. Speaking of Raiders of the North Sea, Renegade has just announced that they'll be bringing this. This was an originally a Kickstarter game, and now Renegade's going to be bringing it over completely. Simon. And Yellow this week both announced maps. This is a minimum advertised price. This means if you wish to sell their game, you cannot offer a discount more than what they said. For Yellow, it's 20%. For CMON, they haven't actually put out the numbers yet. CMON has had this policy for several years now, but they're now making a bigger deal about it and enforcing it. How is this going to affect everything? Well, this is speculation, right? Of course, the internet is all in fury, just like they were when Asmodee did this and when AEG did it and Mayfair did it. And I'm starting to wonder how many companies are going to do it before some people fight back or some one of these, one of these claims will be taken to court at some point to see what will happen. I don't know. Um, so I'm not saying bad or good against it. Um, we're going to see how this pans out and how many other companies will follow suit. Speaking of Asthma Day, they have bought Rory Story Cubes. Once again, they managed to acquire something huge. And you're thinking, Rory Story Cubes, it's a small little thing. It's been on the Amazon top seller list for years. This game has sold tons. It's one of the biggest sellers that there is out there. I remember talking to someone at least four years ago and talking about how much they could not believe this continues to sell and sell and sell. So, of course, Asthma Day wants it. Um, Renegade 
uh, has announced Atlas Enchanted Lands. I really like the artwork of this one. It's a game about fairies, but it looks cool as opposed to like, it's fairies. I mean, like a pink game or something. This one looks interesting. Um, Ares and, uh, let's see, Galacta have uh, w working together to bring this war of mine. It's based on the uh, very popular video game of that. Just got a copy of this, actually, so I'm hoping that this is a good game. Eggert Spiel has announced a game called Heaven and Ale. I just like the cover a lot, so I'm sticking this one in the news. Destination X is a new game in which you are trying to find which country. It's kind of like a companion piece to uh, uh, Scotland Yard where you're trying to find Mr. X. What country is he in? And so this one is by Christian Osby from Aporta Games. I really like Aporta, so I'm really excited about this one. I like games where you try to find Mr. X and things like that. Big news here, Devil Pig and Games Workshop have gone together to make Heroes of the Black Reach. Now this takes their very popular hero systems, Heroes of Normandy, which they had co-published with Yellow at first. This was like a miniatures game, but it used tiles, and it was very tactical, had a few units, it was actually a really well-designed game, and now they're putting it in the Games Workshop, 40, Warhammer 40,000 universe. Well, that's a fascinating combo. Because the thing about Games Workshop is they have these great miniatures, and their games have been, frankly, hmm, at best. This is a great game. Mix that with Games Workshop miniatures. I don't know if it's with miniatures or if it's just going to be um, still with the, the tiles like it was originally. Either way, it's kind of an exciting thing. I'm looking forward to that. Not as much as Sam is, though. Uh, Plaid Hat has talking about Crystal Clans. This is a two-player game. It's an expandable game, just like their two-player game, Summoner Wars, was an expandable game where you buy, you, you, it's not collectible, you just have these things. It looks like a kind of a tactical card combat game. The artwork in this game, as with most of their stuff, is phenomenal. WizKids has Sidereal Confluence Trading and Negotiation in the Elysian Quadrant. I don't know anything about this, but it looks interesting. They say that there are nine asymmetrical races in this game. You'll be taking simultaneous actions along with other players, so that seems interesting at least. Well, that is all the regular news. Let's get to Kickstarter. Happy breakfast, everybody, and to my friends and family, and to the extended Dice Tower friends and family who have served or are serving in the military, I want to say thank you so much for your service, and I hope that you all have a very fine Memorial Day. Okay, let's take a look at what's happening in our crowdfunding world today. Let's kick it off with two very different projects from Indie Boards and Cards. First up is Kokoro. This game combines the hit path-building game Avenue from Aporta Games with the world of Kodama. Cards dictate path shapes that must be drawn as players try to connect flowers and worms to the Kodama sanctuaries. The trick is, each round you must have a higher score than the previous round in order for it to count. Personally, Avenue is one of my all-time favorite games. Simple, engaging, and challenging. Combining it with the beautiful world of Kodama is awesome. And to top it off, Kokoro has created a new board layout that's variable and it's added decree cards that add new drawing options and scoring rules. You can get a copy of Kokoro for a pledge of just $19 plus shipping. Path of Light and Shadow is an empire building and civilization deck building game designed by Travis Chance, John Gilmore, and Nick Little. As players vie to become the leader of the land, they build up their deck from five factions, each of which has its own general kind of strategic focus. One unique element is the ability to promote cards, which replaces the card with one that has higher labor and strength values along with different abilities. And culling your deck has a thematic twist because removing cards gains you cruelty points on the morality track. And that track is central to the game because different factions encourage you to pick the path of cruelty or mercy and provide benefits based on that. Of course, all of this is to support your ability to expand into and control regions on the board. Deck building, tech trees, area control, and snazzy 3D bits are all enhanced by phenomenal art from Beth Sobel. You can get a copy of Path of Light and Shadow for a pledge of $69. Another video game is making its way to the analog world with Deadly Premonition. 
in this competitive detective game, players are trying to solve the murder of Anna Graham. You'll work to move your suspects to be presumed innocent while you work to hone in on which player is the hidden killer. You'll have evidence battles with opponents and will have action cards that provide special abilities for different moments in the game. Some action cards have weather effects, and if you manage to arrest an accomplice of the real killer, you win the game. Deadly Premonition works hard to evoke the video game story, and it encourages role-playing as the different characters. The game plays in under an hour, and you can get a copy for a pledge of $30 plus shipping, and this includes a copy of the video game on Steam. Clash of Rage is a card-driven skirmish game featuring a ton of minis. In this game designed by the designer of Titanium Wars, Frederick Aguillard, players can choose from four unique armies. Cards determine initiative, units that are placed into play, and gold. As you maneuver around the map, you'll not only be battling, you'll also be working to control the Elvish Stones, which can boost your army. Gold gets you equipment, crystals get you legendary equipment, and if you save up, you can also recruit a massive hero to lead your army. If you fail in an assault, you get a rage token that boosts you for the remaining battle, kind of softening the sting of a critical failure. Along with the skirmish mode, there's also a six scenario campaign mode. And the minis for the game look fantastic. Before stretch goals, there were 70 minis in the game, and the sculpts look great. Stretch goals have unlocked even more, and some of them, like the hero figures, are huge. You can get a copy of Clash of Rage for a pledge of 85 euro. Sina Tempora is a game of space colonization. Players take on the role of galactic settlers working to terraform a planet. The mission card determines the modular board layout, which includes 3D cardboard terrain elements. You'll be able to develop your hero with skills and equipment, and while there are over a dozen attributes for each character, only five can be used at a time, which creates a lot of character development variability. Attacking, moving, and using skills makes you use time on the action wheel that's called the momentum, and the more complex the action, the more time it takes. And while the game is competitive, it's not inherently PvP because the enemies are actually working off of an AI system that has them attacking the highest threat value in a region. Exploration missions unlock narrative missions as you go, and the game features minis for the heroes and enemies. And, of course, stretch goals galore have been unlocked, including new settlers, equipment, and other accessories. A copy of Sina Tempora, which includes the Bellier exclusive, takes a pledge of $99. And last but not least, Project Nas is a real-time racing-themed dice game. Now, for full disclosure, I've playtested this game with my daughter a number of times. In Project Nas, players roll dice to match the value on the track as you go down the race course. First one to finish wins. But before the race starts, players get to customize their car by selecting special modification dice that have different abilities like rolling more dice, storing a value for later down the track, or avoiding penalty cubes. It's really these mods that mix up the game and let players kind of cater to their own preferences and abilities. And because the mods are tied to special colored dice, that means you have to make smart choices about when to use them on the track versus saving them for their abilities. Project Nas features thematic art that would feel right at home in Tokyo Drift, and you can get a copy for a pledge of just $20 plus shipping. Okay, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Mora by publisher Simon Games is a fast-paced, dice-driven dungeon crawl set in the Arcadia Quest universe. It's a game of adventure and mysterious exploration. But the game's real mystery is the punch board itself that the dungeon tiles come in. Now, while the game includes 47 different dungeon tiles, the last punch board that's full of them has enough room to fit one more tile. Instead of just 47 dungeon tiles, it could have just as well included 48! See, I only received 47 48ths of the dungeon spaces that I could have! So, why not just print one more dungeon tile in this space instead of leaving it blank and staring at me, taunting me? And so, I wrote a letter to Simon's marketing manager, Jared Miller, requesting a solution to my dilemma. His reply arrived promptly and stated, <clears throat> Dear Chaz, you pose an interesting argument, but there actually isn't a missing 48th tile. 
See, games are designed long before their punch boards are, and while Masmora's 47 dungeon tiles were being designed, the layout of the game's punch boards was not yet known. By the time the punch board configurations were finalized, the game's content had long since been completed. Thank you for your question, and I hope this helps. Well, sure, that answer may be helpful and accurate, but it still leaves me standing here slightly inconvenienced with a punch board that could accommodate one more dungeon tile. So that won't do. Instead, I took matters into my own hands to resolve this ordeal once and for all, and I made my way to the annual Simon Expo to personally confront Jared about my grievance and demand a real solution. Eventually, my persistence did pay off and Jared relented, promising me that he would come up with a better solution to my crisis. And in this afternoon's mail was a package from Jared containing his official solution to my missing 48th dungeon tile. <laughs> so, just goes to prove how with a little persistence and tenacity, you too can get what you so richly deserve. Hi everybody, welcome to Miniature World. Guess what? This really doesn't have a lot to do with miniatures until the end when you'll figure out why. Well, every year I always cover Megacon and Megacon 2017 is one of the biggest uh, pop culture things in, in the Southeast. So we decided to dress up this year and we're gonna have a contest. If you can guess what anime we're from, you will win, and here's where the miniatures come in, a box set of Rune Wars the miniature game. So, here's what you need to do. Don't put it in the comments on below. Email me at novaprime860 at hotmail.com and tell me what anime are we from? See, she's even giving me a little guess. And by the way, don't drop the sugar cube this time, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, until next time, I'm Rob Warren. We'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Gil Mello. And I'm Gabby. And today we'll take a quick look at Atlas, a set collection and area control drafting game for two to six players. Um, this game was designed by Paolo Mori and with art of John Howie, and it's published by uh, Simon Games. In Atlas, you'll call upon mythical creatures like giants, merfolks, and minotaurs to help you become the new leader of the land Atlas by gaining the most glory through three different ages. First, you'll separate each tribe on its own stack. Each tribe has six colors which matches the color for the regions on the board. For each game, you shuffle the setup tribal cards and choose five to six cards depending on the number of players. Those are the tribes you're gonna be using during the game. You can now remove the rest of the tribes from the game and shuffle the ones you chose to create an ally deck. In Atnos, you create bands, doing so by making sets of 1 to 10 cards by color or by race, setting one of them as the band leader. The color of the leader will correspond to the region on the map where you're going to put one of your glory tokens. The player with the most glory tokens in each region will score the points at the end of each age for that region, which is set by those glory point tokens placed in the beginning of the game and designated to each area. If you had two glory tokens in the purple region of Duras, I will have to make a band with three or more cards in order to place a token there again. The size of your band will allow you to score different amounts of glory points according to the graph showing on the bottom right of the board. Once the third dragon is drawn, the age ends and now players score their glory points for that age. I just love Atlas. It's an easy, fun, and very elegant game. It just became uh, my game of choice to introduce new players to the hobby. Bye! Who 
right, so what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, Z has board game Blender that's coming out. I'll be taking a look at the new expansion for Dice Masters. Um, I'll be telling you why I love Twilight Struggle as much as I do. And I'm going to be doing some spoiler looks at Exit, the Exit games and Deckscape. Now, if you don't want to know how these games work, if you don't know what, how these games, you know, you don't want to have them spoil for you, don't watch these. But we'll clearly delineate what these are. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things coming out this week. We also have a new um, Dice Tower, which will be coming out. It might be slightly delayed because of me flying tomorrow. So it might come up either later Tuesday or early Wednesday. But don't forget to check that out. And you can check out all our fantastic podcasts that are part of the Dice Tower Network at DiceTowerNetwork.com. All right, let's move on. Hey everyone, it's lunchtime! Today we're going to be looking at Avenue, published by Aporta Games, designed by Eilif Svensson and Christian Ospie. It plays 1 to 10 players ages 8 and up in about 15 to 20 minutes. So this game is fun. I'm terrible at it, but it's fun. So, <laughs> so everyone's going to have their own player sheet, so we have a nice pad here. And we're actually going to be able to draw some kind of road type things on this. I always want to say rails, I think of rail games, but it's more of a road. So you'll notice we've kind of a display here, I'll also show a little uh, picture of that. Uh, we're going to have different types of roads that we can draw, and we're also going to have the farms that we're trying to draw these roads to. The goal is to try and draw the longest one that connects to the most grapes and the most farms and to the castles to get the most points. Wow, that's a lot of information. <laughs> we're going to keep flipping cards over until we hit the fourth yellow card, which means, uh-oh, that's it, so we're going to have to score. So this is the time to make sure that you've hit all those places. So once we've hit the fourth yellow card, we're gonna score. And basically you want to try and make sure that your score is better than the previous. So the first round, we're not trying to bet anything, but the next one, you want it to be higher or you get a big fat goose egg, which is worth minus five points at the end of the game. Not so good. Another action that you can do instead of drawing a road is to peek at the next farm that could be coming up. So that might be useful down the road. Exactly. Most points at the end of the game wins. So I'm sure these two will let me know if I missed something down there. No, that's all good. And what I really like is you never know when these yellow ones are going to come out. So it really can kind of rush you. You might have multiple cars, but you might have like the first four cars might come out as, as, as yellow. So that can actually be really stressful because especially if you don't score your next farm higher than the last one, you actually lose points. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty bad. It's not actually, you're not actually rolling dice as in other rolling rights, but the card randomization basically acts like dice in that sense to tell you which roads you can, which road segments you can draw on your map. So I feel like this is a Suzanne game because <laughs> she has so many rolling rights, even though it's not like a rolling right, but I don't know. I feel like it, that's a good thing, by the way. That means it's super awesome. <laughs> you could probably, as long as you can all see the cards, I think you play this even more. That'd but, be the trick, yeah. Too many players around the table, you might have trouble seeing the cards. Right. But laminate these guys. If we're going to play with multiple players multiple times, just laminate these guys and you can play for Ever. Yeah, so I think that's it. I love this game and we'll definitely play, be playing more of it. So that's it. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Hello everyone, my name is Annette and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over Finca and the unique use of a rondelle. So I'm going to show you how the rondelle is applied in the game and also what I really like about it. So here you have the two player game set up for Finca, but I'm mainly interested in this rondelle wheel right here. Most of the action will happen on this rondelle wheel where every player will move one of their farmers and then also acquire different fruit along with these different donkeys which will help them deliver to different Fincas on the board. Every player will select one of their farmers and move it in a clockwise direction. Depending on how many farmers are on a blade, they will move that many spaces forward. However many farmers are on that space that they landed on, including their own, they will go ahead and collect that many fruit. In this example, they'll collect two figs. Whenever a farmer passes his dividing line either here or on this other side, they will also get to collect one donkey. These donkeys are very important because they will help you deliver these different fruit that you are collecting. Once you collect these fruit, then you can deliver them to these different fincas, and then you will turn them in in order to score points. The number of workers in every set location will guide you as far as how many spaces they'll move forward. And also, whenever that farmer lands on a certain spot, the number of farmers at that location will guide you as to how many you collect. That simple use of just movement and placement and collection is really unique in this game of Finca. 
So what I like about Finca is the fact that explaining the rondelle is not overly complex and it yet offers a lot of really interesting decisions for every player on their turn. If you're looking for a unique game that will offer this rondelle system without being too complex, I highly suggest trying out Finca. So let's take a look at what's on the shelf this time. We have Dual Vages, which despite being this Dual Vages 2, by the way, it's in these two boxes, also the codex here. Despite this game being out of, not out of print, but I mean, it's still, it's not in print. I guess you can find it places. And it's, you know, creaks around the corners. I still really like it. I like the whole playing against your opponent with all different kinds of things happening, all kinds of weird scenarios, a lot of fun. This game here is a small one here called Arbos. This one, Arbos Awful. This is building a tree. It's a, kind of a dexterity style game. That's a lot of fun. And then we got the wonderful, marvelous Marco Polo here, which I really have blinged out on the inside. I'm pretty happy about that. Actually, I have Stone Age blinged out too. Both of these resource games, Stone Age is much lighter than Marco Polo, but I like them both a lot. Then over here, this is from Dogmite. This is a dice tower that actually looks like our logo. Probably my favorite looking dice tower. And then this is one of our dice towers from E-Raptor, which is, you know, part plastic and part wood. Very sturdy and easy to use. So that's what's on the shelf this week. My name's Dan, and this is Cora, and we're here today to talk to you about board games for children of about five and under. Yeah. And today, we're very hot, aren't we, Cora? Yeah. That's why we're all I got sunburned. She's got sunburned, and you've had an allergic reaction to your sun cream, haven't mm -hmm. you? So we've both got bright red faces. But anyway, today we're talking about this game. What is it, Cora? Wizardry to the Power of Three. Wizardry to the Power of Three. Wizardry to the Power of Three is a cooperative memory game where the players are little wizards running through a haunted forest trying to escape a pursuing ghost. On their turn, each player rolls three dice and then has to uncover matching symbols under a set of tiles on the game board. For every matching symbol they uncover, they get to move forward one space. However, if they get one wrong, then their turn ends immediately and they can move no further. This might well be my favourite kids game I've played this year. Mainly because I love how involved and how, how invested Cora gets when she's playing. One, two, three. I'm nearly there. <laughs> I'm going to... They go, they go So, Cora, did you like this game? Yeah. What do you like about it? I don't know really. I just like it. You just like it. Do you know what I like about it? I like the fact it's a cooperative game where the children have more to contribute than the adults do really because you're much better at remembering where things are than I am, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you get really excited all the way through it as well, don't you? Yeah, well, I'm really actually scared. You're scared when the ghost comes to get you? Yeah, I'm scared like we're going to get something on and the ghost is going to end the game. Yeah, yeah, we, we came very, very close. Every time we played this game, we come very close, just inches away from losing. And again, that's a really good sign. And we always win. And we've always won so far, but it's always been you who's rescued us by remembering where things are, which is good. <laughs> so we give Wizardry to the Power of Three two spooky thumbs up. Welcome to the thrift store where two brothers with five whole dollars attempt to find the most interesting or strange board game from yesteryear and review it for you. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. Oh man. So this week, we have a really dangerous game that takes place in the jungle. So we decided to find a dangerous place to do this review. Problem is, we live in Los Angeles. Yeah. Not a lot of jungle. No, but uh, we did go outside. That feels dangerous. There's a tree right there for reference. This week's game is... Jungle Jiggle. Doodle doodle jungle Jiggle. Oh, yeah. Okay, so in Jungle Jiggle, you were trying to assemble an animal through rolling dice. Each piece of the animal has a number on it. So in the first version of the game, everyone's going to take turns rolling a die at the same time, and if they have that piece down here in the pile, they can pick up that part of their animal. The back leg of the lion is a six, that's what I rolled. Then we go again. Once you've gotten all pieces of your animal, then you get to assemble it. If you're the first one to assemble it, you win. 
There's a second version of the game as well where all of the pieces are now in the center and available. And people take turns one at a time rolling a die and they can pick up any piece with the number six on it, for instance. And you roll again and going around and around, you're gonna end up with some sort of freaky hybrid animal. Once you have six pieces and everybody attempts to build the most complete weird animal that they can. And if it can stand and it's pretty complete, you win. So that was the most jiggly jungle of all time. Uh, uh, so first thing, this game is says is for ages three and up. And it is hardcore for three-year-olds. Yeah. But that being said, because you can make these weird monstrosity of animals, I feel like a three-year-old would actually really find it fun. The second version of the game is kind of fun if you just really try to build the weirdest thing possible. Yeah. I have a Lyzeb Draphant. I have a Draphabophant. What is this? Glorious. Evolution at its finest. <laughs> so that was Jungle Jiggle. You can check us out, the Brothers Murph, on all forms of social media. Hey, Shane. Yeah. I guess until next time, we'll see you at the thrift store. We'll see you there. All right, it is time to get mathy. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, um, YouTube has lots of stats. I follow our YouTube stats very carefully, always keeping an eye on them. And I thought I might pull back the curtain because you can see some stats. You can see how many views we have and how many subscribers we have. But there's a lot of stats that you can have when you look at your channel. Now, this might not be interesting to you, so just skip to the next section. But I found some of this stuff interesting. Uh, when we started on February 2nd, 2008, that was the first day we had views, there was 49 views. <laughs> um, and then uh, our highest ever was January 12th of this year, where we had 136,108 views in one day. Not a big deal. Some people get that the minute they put a video out pff, on that video. But that still, for us, was a big jump. We're probably averaging around 90,000 views a day now, which is pretty cool. I'm always like, ooh, what's our next thing? 90,000. Like right now, I'm like, ooh, when are we going to get to 100,000? When are we going to get to 100,000? We did have 100,000 average in January and December of last year. But if you look at the views of the Dice Tower, they always are lowest in March and June. Those are our two lowest months for whatever reason. April may go up a little bit from March. Uh, well, and then they go down into June. Then July starts creeping up and August and September gets higher. A Little bit of a dip in October. Then November, December are always huge. And that's because of Christmas and all the games announced at, at uh, Gen Con and Essen are like in full boom and everyone wants to see the reviews of them. January is also huge every year. I don't know why. I think it's because we, first we do our live marathon usually that, that time, but we also, um, we're running our Kickstarter, our fundraising program, and we still have a lot of great games from Essen, maybe. I, I don't know what the reasoning is behind that, or maybe people are just too cold to go anywhere, so they stay inside and watch the reviews. Um, our biggest review, our biggest video views, is our top 10 essential games of all time, with over a million views. Number two is the top 10 games we hate, proving the internet likes negativity, with 427,000 overrated games. 412, cooperative games, 379, essential games. That's actually the remake we did of the original one is already up to 358,000. And then two-player games, 311, games that murdered others, 271,000. Annoying rules, 262,000. And top 10 games for the classroom. Reviews don't hit as high, right? Uh, our top 10 lists are our biggest thing on our channel. Our highest review is Dominion with 225,000. Why Dominion? I don't know, but people tend to, I guess that's, it's not even that, it's like back when I did low quality videos and stuff. Mage Knight is our second highest, then Cosmic Encounter, makes sense, Twilight Imperium 3, and Scythe, which is pretty interesting because Scythe has, is, I think, less than a year that review has been up and it already has 153,000. Of all our videos, we have 84 videos that have over 100,000 views and 302 videos that have over 50,000 views. Um, each year I look at how many views we get per month. And so like this year, um, on May 24th, I think we passed May last year. We see about a 30% increase in views as time goes by. Right now, like I said, we have around 105 million views. And in 2016, we got 29 million of those. So almost one third of our views were in that one year. It's really just increasing, which is really cool. 
And also, you know, it's because we have over 8,000 videos on our channel, so people are still watching those. Subscribers, we don't have as many as other channels do compared to how many views we have, because I understand people don't necessarily want to subscribe to the Dice Tower. We put out a ton of content. My goal has never been that you watch all our stuff. My goal is that you watch our stuff. You know, you're like, hey, I want to watch a review on this. Does the Dice Tower have it? You betcha. Um, so we have 222, well, over the years we got 222,000 subscribers, but we lost 68,000. So we have 153,000. That makes sense. Um, an unfortunate thing, and this is something I'm really working hard to change, right? 93% of our viewers are male, 7% female. Now, probably the female is higher than that because I know a lot of couples watch her things. So, but even if it was 20%, yeah, it could be better. Uh, so we will try to continue and change it. Hopefully our channel will appeal to everyone there. Our demographics, our highest demographic is uh, 25 to 34, which is lower than I thought. That's half of the people who watch our show. 35 to 44 is the second highest. And then 18 to 24. Again, I thought it would skew a little bit older than that. The country that watches our reviews the most, the United States, of course, then Canada, then United Kingdom, then Germany, then Australia, then Sweden, Netherlands, Poland, Belgium, Denmark, Brazil. And then uh, the highest one we have in Asia is the Philippines, which uh, we don't have nearly as many views in Asia, hardly any from Africa. Uh, most of our views are from English-speaking countries, which makes sense. Um, we have over a million likes on our videos. That's exciting. And we have 41, almost 42,000 dislikes. I guess that's a decent ratio. So what videos have gotten the most dislikes? Well, the top 10 games everybody should own. Gets a lot of dislikes just because it has a million views. So you would assume its dislikes are high up there. Number two is Dark Souls board game. Don't take off a video game community, folks. Our top 10 war games, I expected that one. Top 10 games that need to be dethroned um, and games we hate. So different games. Uh, an interview we did with Asthma, they has a lot of negative thumbs. And unfortunately, the Suzanne and Mandy video where they, they talked about inclusive gaming has a lot of negative thumbs, which is just a shame on the people who do those. Um, let's see, any other stats here? Where do most of our videos, where do people come from? Well, that's hard to tell. A lot of them come from, you know, just stumbling across a review from other YouTube channels. Rado, Richard Ham sends us the most people. From websites, Board Game Geek sends us the most. Our own website, Dice Tower, is number two after Board Game Geek. Then searches, then Reddit, Facebook, Kickstarter, Board Game Arena. And the company that the most people come to the website is Yellow. Go figure. All right. Well, that's a lot of information. Probably boring to most of you, but I find this stuff fascinating. I won't talk about it for a long time. But anyway, I just thought I would share some stats. I'm not trying to brag with these stats at all. I'm really not, okay? Because no matter how much, I'm like, look how many views we have, we're still not even like in the top 10,000 YouTube channels in the world, right? So what can we brag about? Yay, we got a lot of people, but you know what? We do appreciate that we're growing. We do appreciate that people watch us and we're always striving to be better and move on. And, and the numbers like this help me like, oh, where can we improve? Obviously, when people say, why do you do top 10 lists? Um, because of this, people like them. So there's that. All right, folks, more board game breakfast coming up right now. Hi, Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games. Today, I'd like to shine a Solo Mode spotlight on two recent games with a Solo Mode that have very similar mechanics. I'm talking about Sagrada and Role Player. Both of these games employ a dice drafting and placement mechanic where you are having to put dice on particular player boards. Here's the player board, one of the player boards for Sagrada. You can see here that you're placing die uh, in particular areas, placing dice in particular areas depending on color and number, and there are other simple uh, placement rules and restrictions. Here's the player board for role player. It's a similar situation where you have different colored dice that you're going to be drafting and placing onto this grid according to particular rules. And so the question then becomes, is there a need for both? Or is one better than another? Uh, it's not quite that simple in my mind. It really depends on what you're looking for. 
I think Sagrada is maybe a little bit more accessible because the rules are more simple. There's a little bit less uh, of a rules overhead to it. It's almost abstract in nature, but it is gorgeous. It's a beautiful presentation. This idea of creating your own uh, stained glass window is something that can appeal to almost anybody. However, Role Player is a game that has a more immersive theme, and if you enjoy this idea of creating a role-playing character and personalizing it uh, according to different attributes, this one really would uh, speak to you as well. So I think there's a place for both. I'm going to keep both in my collection, and depending on what your uh, interests are, you might be interested in one or both. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great day. Hi, this is Gary Pope from Late to the Table, and this is What Should I Get? We basically browse through the What Should I Get mega thread on Reddit. We basically look for games to suggest for people to get. So, let's go ahead and start. Mocha21 basically wants to start getting into zombie side and is not sure whether to go with Black Plague or Rube Morgue. If that's how it's pronounced. With this one, without a doubt, it's definitely Black Plague that you want to go with. They just added way too many cool things in that one. It's great. Get that one. Snake the Sniper basically wants something that's along the lines of like Eldritch Horror and Warhammer except without a campaign. For this one I definitely would suggest getting either Elder Signs or Arcadia Quest. Both work really well. Three Little Piggies can't decide between Comet and Inish and game time is really crucial. If you absolutely require five players then you gotta go with Comet because Inish doesn't have five players. But if time really is the main factor then you gotta go with Inish because that's definitely the shorter game out of the two. Especially at all player counts. Paco LG is wondering between Inish and Ethnos. If you want the shorter game, the higher player count, and you don't mind top decking, Ethnos. Any other reasons? Inish. In my opinion, this is a better, better game. Miles Allen is basically looking for a game for the niece and nephew. They're roughly around the age of 10 and 13. Also, just to mention, they would like to stick with co-ops if possible. So for this one, I definitely would suggest Mysterium, Hanabi, and for any of the Forbidden games at this point. Maddie Flynn's basically looking for a board game for their sister's birthday. They seem to already like Betrayal and House of the Hill, Resistance, Love Letter, and I think they'll prefer games that allow a lot of players to play. For this, I kind of would suggest rounding out the collection with uh, Sushi Go Party. That's a really good large group drafting game. If you have any questions yourself, be sure to go on to Reddit on the board game subreddit and post in the What Should I Get mega thread, which is there daily at this point. And this is Gary Pope from Late to the Table, and I hope you're enjoying your breakfast. Today we're looking at some tabletop coins. Tabletop is a show about board games from Mr. Will Wheaton. And we have some coins here that they made for the show. Now I'm a big sucker for metal coins. So let's take a look at these. Uh, they got ones, fives, twenties, and a hundred denominations. These are actually really good. Uh, they, each one's a different shape, a different color, really easy to differentiate. You know, they got the big tabletop logo on them. We got cards, a meeple, a dodecahedron, 20-sided die, and then people around a table. So this is an interesting thought to me. You know, I wonder, is it worth making like dice tower coins? I don't know, we'll have to see someday. It depends on price and if people actually want them, but I could see myself using these in a lot of games. They're pretty nice. Hi everyone. Düsseldorf, where I live, is home to one of Europe's largest Japanese communities. And every year the city tries to make an effort to give more insight into this land of the rising sun. A day filled with authentic Japanese things like dance, music, sport and don't forget food. Over 700,000 people attended. Again there were a lot of cosplayers filling the streets. And late in the evening there was this spectacular display of Japanese fireworks. It was great to see, hear and taste so much of the Japanese culture. This week I am playing a game that is all about Japanese food. This week I am playing Sushi Go. 
Sushi Go is all about the game mechanic that we call drafting. And it means each player is dealt a hand of cards. You choose one of those cards and put it in front of you and you pass the other cards to your left neighbor. From your right neighbor you get their leftover cards. Again, you choose one, put it in front of you and pass the rest of the cards until there are no more cards to pass. But which cards do you choose? Well, every card depicts a sushi dish. For example, the nigiri cards are worth one, two or three points. Try to eat more maki rolls than your opponents and you get six points or try to gather as many dumplings as you can because more dumplings mean more points for you. I love teaching this game to people who are not into board games because they immediately want to play it again and again. It is also a good stepping stone for other board games that use the same drafting mechanic like Seven Wonders. If you like this game I urge you to check out Sushi Go Party because it is an expanded version of the game. You can play it with more people and you have dishes that you can swap out. So you might want to play with the green tea ice cream or have some tofu. So that's another great game that I highly recommend. That's Sushi Go or Sushi Go Party. Thanks for watching. My name is Dave Luza. See you next week at the UK Games Expo or at another board game breakfast. Bye. Why the heck am I outside? What does this have to do with gaming? I am Chris Renshaw from the Boards and Swords podcast and welcome to a role play. I'm on travel this week and this is a lot better scenery than the inside of my hotel room. But it also got me thinking about the last way that is good for trying out RPGs and that is travel, specifically conventions. Conventions are a great way to try out a good RPG because they're usually small time spaces usually three to four hours that you could block be like I'm gonna try out this RPG during this time period and after that you don't have to worry about it if you didn't like it no harm no foul for instance every Gen Con that I go to I always try and find some new system to try out and that's largely because I do another show focused on different RPGs but it's also because it's hard to sell someone on trying a new RPG when you yourself have never really played it but once you've played the game, they're like, oh, this is great. I had this much fun. We played with, we did this, and this is how this works. And you have these kind of encounters, and it's really simple, really easy to run, and you know, whatever. It's easier to sell it to getting people to play a game regularly when you've actually played the game yourself, and you can be able to show people how to play. It's just like in a board game, when it's easier to get people to play a board game if you already know how to play the game and you're just teaching everyone else the rules. Same thing applies for RPGs. So the next time you're at a convention and you're going to an area and you've got some time scheduled to try out some new board games, maybe try an RPG. See if you like it. Thanks for watching. Have you ever tried RPGs at conventions before? If so, let me know down in the comments below. And in the meantime, may all your hits be crits. One of my favorite things about doing these videos for Snakes and Lattes is uh, meeting fans and helping to inspire people to follow their passion and get into the board game cafe business. I'm here today with Emma and Ahmed and their wonderful kids, and they are about to open a game cafe in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, we decided to leave the UAE a couple of years ago and we were trying to decide what to do and Emma suggested, because we'd been to Snakes and Lattes every time we visit Toronto, she said, why don't you open a game cafe in Wellington because there's nothing like that there. Yeah, and it's Ahmed's major passion and we kind of thought Wellington doesn't have anything like it. At the time, New Zealand had nothing like it and we thought, you know, we've seen how popular it is here and how much fun it is. I emailed um, Snakes and Lattes asking if they had any advice and I got a res response saying, check out our YouTube channel. So I did and I've watched all the videos and listened to Snakes cast. And then I started watching all of the videos as well and, and I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. I could start seeing how this idea might actually work and I don't know what New Zealand's gonna be like, how, welcome this idea is in, in, in New Zealand. Wellington has a huge cafe culture. It's very, has amazing cafes, amazing coffee, amazing beers, amazing food. And so that side of things might be a bit tricky, but I think the gaming aspect is going to be something new and exciting. We've been introducing games to our friends and family for the last year, 
and everyone just jumps on board yeah, like, it's eagerly. A, it's amazing. Yeah. So, if you find yourselves in Wellington, New Zealand, do visit Tactica and uh, have a game or two. And uh, thanks for chatting. And uh, remember, if you have questions about how to snakes, send them to asksnakes at snakesandlattes.com. Happy gaming. Psst. The people at Tactica wanted me to let you know that they've changed their name. Now they're counterculture. Spread the word. Panic stations, it's finally happened. Deathcon 1 or 5 or like whichever one's highest. 7? Is 7 a lot of Deathcons? It sounds like a lot. What comes after red alert? Like infrared alert? Is that, is that, is that a thing? That wouldn't make sense. The only person I could see infrared alert would be like lizards or predator. Not today, predator. You. I was at work the other day absolutely not thinking about arson and my friend we'll call him Ali because that's his name well he came out with this phrase so you like board games then I would kind of like to get into board games they look really cool cool I thought they're amazing and you know you wait for this to happen don't you but when it does panic panic I froze up quicker than the funds to my non-profit Sasquatch research facility. Now we'll never find him. So he used to play 40k. Ali, not Bigfoot. Bigfoot would be terrible at 40k. It's too fiddly. And we arranged a board game night for him to try out some Euros that he actually expressed an interest in. I was actually really nervous because with you guys I love talking about board games. But with someone new, I mean, it's a huge responsibility. And I don't want to mess it up because I want to show them how cool board games are. Because, as you know, they're hella cool. So if any of you ever felt the ambassadorial pressure, let me know in the comments below. Also, if I see any of you at the UK Game Expo, then absolutely say hello if you feel in any way inclined. I'll be the one lurking in the corner wearing a bandana and this face. See ya! All right, so that's it for board game breakfast this week. Um, remember what I said, uh, next week we're going to be late and I apologize about that because we're gonna be at the UK Gaming Expo. Also, I'm gonna keep reminding you every week, one of the best conventions of the year is the Dice Tower Cruise. You definitely wanna sign up for it. It is so much fun. We had such a blast last year. Go to DiceTowerCruise.com to learn more and sign up today. You will not regret it. Of course, check online to find out our schedules for both the UK Gaming Expo and for Origins. And of course, we always appreciate all of you watching the Dice Tower, watching Board Game Breakfast each week. I want to say a special thank, out, thank you to all the contributors. And until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and this has been Board Game Breakfast. Don't forget, we're going to be a week late next week. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Today we're looking at some tabletop coins. Tabletop is a show about board games from Mr. Will Wheaton, and we have some coins here that they made for the show. Now, I'm a big sucker for metal coins, so let's take a look at these. Uh, they got ones, fives, twenties, and a hundred denominations. These are actually really good. Uh, they, each one's a different shape, a different color, really easy to differentiate. You know, they got the big tabletop logo on them. We got cards, a meeple, a dodecahedron 20-sided die, and then people around a table. So this is an interesting thought to me. You know, I wonder, is it worth making like dice tower coins? I don't know, we'll have to see someday. It depends on price and if people actually want them, but I could see myself using these in a lot of games. They're pretty nice.